It's five o'clock and Michigan Governor Gretchen Whitmer is spending her afternoon taking the pulse of her constituents. What has come in. State still in the clutches of COVID-19. I thought I'd just check in and see how you're doing. Today she's making calls across the state, trying to ease concerns amid so much uncertainty. I know that this is a tough time, especially in the restaurant industry. Only 14 months into her first term. Now this Democratic firebrand is staring down a crisis that could help propel her all the way to the vice presidency. <laughs> or drive an even deeper wedge into her already divided state. Each of these executive orders are, are these are powers I never imagined I'd have to use as governor. And yet we've had to execute some really tough decisions. The lifelong Michigander has had a traditional ascension to her job former prosecutor and legislator, she won her 2018 gubernatorial race by almost 10 percentage points. Now it's a watershed moment for Whitmer, who's emerged into the national consciousness as one of the most vocal and controversial governors of the crisis, earning her own moniker from the president. Don't call the woman in Michigan. I have a job to do. I'm a Democrat and I'm proud to be a Democrat, but I am the governor of Michigan, all almost 10 million people in this state, whether they voted for me or not. Their lives matter to me. Tonight, a look at the governor of Michigan, key swing state in a slice of America, encompassing farmers, auto workers, and a vulnerable community paying some of the highest toll in this pandemic. In late February, before Michigan confirmed any cases, she activated the state's emergency response center. I've signed an executive order declaring a state of emergency. 11 days later, the state confirmed its first two cases. The governor launched one of the most robust responses in the country, shutting down schools and issuing a statewide stay-at-home order. You use the terms tough decisions, aggressive action. Why lead in that way to have such a muscular response when other governors have made different decisions? Well, Michigan has the 10th largest population. We currently still have the third largest number of deaths from COVID-19. Our hospitals were at capacity just days into it. The trajectory we were on says that we would have had about 200,000 people need to be hospitalized right now, where now it's about 4,000. And so these actions have worked. What do you make of the Trump administration's response to this pandemic? I said early on that I think that we should have a national strategy. I know that that was something that got the attention of my critics and, and that that was something that they latched onto. But I didn't say something that other governors haven't said too. Her criticism has been returned by the president and by some of her own constituents. Earlier this month, Operation Gridlock, a protest that was in part organized by the Michigan Conservative Coalition, drew thousands to the Capitol building, residents defying the state's stay-at-home order. You know, it's time for our state to be opened up. We're tired of not being able to buy the things that we need, go to the hairdressers, get our hair done. It's time to open up. You know, the, the call to action was to stay in their cars. If they had done that, it wouldn't have been so concerning, but they congregated without masks. People were flying Confederate flags, which is not something you see very often at the Michigan Capitol. People were, um, you know, have anti-choice protesters were out there and open carry advocates were out there. This was more of a political rally than it was um, a, a statement of the stay home order. I was there for six and a half hours. It wasn't a Trump rally, as she liked to say. Rich Kowalski drove nearly 100 miles to join the demonstration, a construction contractor who recently had to lay off a quarter of his employees. I've never protested anything in my life, but I feel that I was, and I am, being punished to a certain extent, and I have no control over that. I can't go to work, I can't practice my trade, I can't make any money to support my family. He says he's applied for PPP and for loans, but is yet to get an answer, and for the first time filed for unemployment. This hurts me. It pained me to apply for unemployment. It approved me for $160. What, what can I do with $160? I mean, I don't, I can't even barely pay my phone bill with that. I could lose everything. He stopped taking a salary to help keep his business afloat. He understands the need to stop this deadly virus, but not how the directive was implemented. People, if they're told what to do and they're told how serious it is, I believe they would follow the guidelines. But a blanket closure. It's going to hurt our economy. His thoughts on the governor's policies are echoed in pockets across the state, 
all the way in Kalamazoo. Yeah, I thought they were horrible. I think she's ruining our state. Why do we have to kill the economy to save lives? Uncle and nephew, both named Fred Fleetstra, run this dairy farm and note that over 70% of Michigan's cases have been concentrated in only three counties. I feel for the Detroit area, I feel for Chicago, the big city area, but if you look at all the concentrations, they're all right around the big city. I think some limitations could be done there, and I think it's very, very wrong for our governor to limit the rest of the state the way it is. Here in this part of Michigan, farming is all these men have ever known. My grandpa bought this farm back in 1917. It has been in the family ever since. All across the country, the dairy business has been in flux. Many of these farmers' products end up as milk in your coffee or as cheese on your pizza. As the food service industry has been shut down, their milk has had no place to go. To get it bottled is a big issue. When 70% of the milk product that we produce as farmers goes into uh, food service agencies, all of a sudden this processing facility cannot handle uh, the bottling department of it. With nowhere for the milk to go, farmers across the nation have had to take the devastating step of dumping their dairy. The Vleetstras haven't had to dump yet, but still their profits have been slashed almost in half. Now, this has had a huge effect on us. If you could somehow just kind of put the cows into an idle mode for a while, that would be great, uh, but it doesn't work that way. We thank our farmers for, for being a critical part of our food supply, and yet right now in Kalamazoo, we're watching numbers that are concerning, because if we have a growth in Kalamazoo or in a rural part of Michigan, we won't have the kind of hospital systems um, that can meet a need that a community that is growing out of control. COVID-19 doesn't recognize county line. In Detroit, the epicenter of this state's outbreak, State Representative Tyrone Carter knows that all too well. There was a fire, and she took a blanket and threw it over the entire state to try to smother this fire. Just after sitting down... Yes. Can you wait two minutes? Sure, I yes, gotta sir. go vote. Be right back. Oh, yes, sir. Some business to attend to. A House vote in the state's Republican-controlled legislature to challenge Governor Whitmer's emergency powers. And which way did you go, if I may ask? No. I think she's done a phenomenal job. A survivor of COVID-19 himself, he stands firmly by the governor's forceful stay-at-home orders, pointing to the disproportionate number of black lives claimed in his own district. It's impacting certain areas more than others. So, hmm, it's a geographical, it's an ethnic issue. When 14 percent of our population is African-American and yet 40 percent of our deaths are African-American Michiganders, it tells you that we've got a real racial problem in, in our state and that Michigan is not unique from the other states in, in the United States of America. The industrial giants of the state automakers also not immune. As the case count rose in March, the humming on the factory line of the big three silence. It is. 6.35, and uh, I just pulled into the parking lot at work. But two weeks later, a fraction of workers at four plants around Detroit returned. Good morning from Flat Rock Assembly. No longer to make Mustangs, but ventilators, masks, and face shields. You've got to stand on the X, and when you're, it's your turn, you walk forward. This factory has been a second home for Cindy Parkhurst since it opened more than 30 years ago, but it now comes with new requirements. Good morning, Damon. Stand on the yellow line, remove your glasses, get a temperature scan. You're good. Thank you. Grab a face mask. These 600 or so auto workers, some of the first to experience an uneasy new normalcy when industries return. I do think there's going to be some apprehension. Nobody wants to get sick. Nobody wants to expose their family members and their loved ones. So. We have a lot to adjust to. The pandemic and jobs looming, especially as a presidential election approaches. It is an open secret that you are reportedly on the short list for vice president as Joe Biden's running mate. All I'm focused on is trying to get through this global pandemic that has ravaged my state. And I'm appreciative of the fact that he has called to check in. He's asked thoughtful questions. He's given me some counsel as I've navigated this. And that's been the extent of our conversations. I ask this respectfully as someone who's been rumored to be on the short list of vice presidential candidates with Joe Biden. 
As you know, former staffer in Joe Biden's Senate office has raised allegations of sexual assault from almost 30 years ago. I think that uh, women should be able to tell their stories. I know that um, as a survivor myself that those two things are, are important to me personally and I think important to women everywhere and important to our country. I'll add that in doing that investigation, it has appeared as though there's not been, a, you know, much beyond that to the story. And I would just say that the Joe Biden that I know, these stories are inconsistent with, with what I know and what I've seen in terms of the work that he's done to support women. In a statement, his campaign says in part, Biden firmly believes that women have a right to be heard. What is clear about this claim, it is untrue. This absolutely did not happen. Whether or not Governor Whitmer ends up on the ticket this fall remains to be seen. But as the governor of a swing state that will be crucial in the presidential election, her profile and scrutiny on her will undoubtedly continue to grow. I'm doing everything I can to do right by the people of Michigan, to save lives from COVID-19. And that's why I've implored everyone to remember we are not one another's enemies. The enemy is a virus, and it doesn't distinguish by people based on their political parties. Hi, everyone. George Stephanopoulos here. Thanks for checking out the ABC News YouTube channel. If you'd like to get more videos, show highlights, and watch live event coverage, click on the right over here to subscribe to our channel. And don't forget to download the ABC News app for breaking news alerts. Thanks for watching.